Welcome everyone to our Bible study. We are in the book of 2 Corinthians and we're starting the last chapter of that book, chapter 13. And uh, we're going to look at uh, this final chapter and our final lesson here in our final study of uh, the book of 2 Corinthians. And um, it kind of wraps up Paul's defense of his apostleship. And then at the very end, it kind of takes us back to the beginning of the book and we come full circle. So I thought the best way to approach that is to take just a little time here at the beginning of the lesson and to review briefly what we've uh, looked at and talked about in this book and in connection with the Corinthians, and then uh, we'll go into uh, into chapter 13. So uh, chapter 13, this chapter of uh, 2 Corinthians, uh, Paul talks about this is the third time I'm coming to you, and we mentioned that in our last lesson that we don't know exactly what these three visits are that Paul is talking about, whether he actually came to Corinth on two previous occasions, and this would be the third that he's looking toward in the future, if he's talking about the letters that he wrote, or if he's counting his visit and his letters. uh, We're just not exactly sure about that. But it's meant to remind us, and the emphasis here is that Paul understood clearly what was happening and what was taking place in Corinth. He had clear uh, knowledge of it, and so his judgment about them obviously is by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, uh, but it's also with the evidence of, of what was going on there. He wasn't just guessing. He knew what was happening. So to, to back that up and to remind us of that as a way of review, I want us to read a few verses in connection with Paul's preaching. So we go to Acts chapter 17, and in verse 1, the Bible says, Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, notice this, as his manner was, went in unto them. And three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus, whom I preach unto you, is Christ, is the anointed, the Messiah. Verse 4 says, Some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas, and of the devout Greeks a great multitude, and of the chief women not a few. So this was Paul's manner. This was his manner of approach. This is how he went about preaching and teaching the gospel. He would go into a city. He would then go into the synagogue. He would find the Jewish community population there, and he would preach to them, especially on the Sabbath days when they would be gathered together and assembling. He would use it as an opportunity to uh, to preach to them the gospel. And he did so by reasoning with them out of the scriptures opening and alleging that Christ fulfilled the Old Testament scriptures through his suffering, his death, and his resurrection, and therefore he is the Messiah. So in Paul's preaching and teaching, it was always built upon and based upon scripture. So when he came to Corinth, it was no different. He opened God's word and showed them from the Old Testament uh, prophecies and teaching that Jesus was the fulfillment of those. So as evidence of Christ's authority and identity and as evidence of the truth of Paul's preaching, he had started with the scriptures. Okay, Then we go to chapter 18 of Acts, which is when Paul came to Corinth and, of course, was preaching there among them. Verse 4 says that he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. So we notice again that Paul, first of all, is meeting with the Jewish population at the synagogue and on the Sabbath day, but he's reasoning with them. So not only had Paul presented the gospel to them built on the foundation of the truth of Scripture, the Old Testament Scriptures, it's also built on the foundation of reason. So when Paul preached to them, He did so with reason, with logic. So the idea is 
that if they look back at what they've been taught and what they believed and what they obeyed, in order to turn away from that, they have to turn away from reason. So Paul didn't come into Corinth and, you know, trick them into obeying the gospel. He didn't come with some deceptive message. He didn't present this picture, but he kind of, you know, hid the things that maybe wouldn't stand up to questioning or to reasoning, but he did everything with reason. So they could not only know what he was teaching, but they could understand the foundation of it and know that what they had believed and obeyed was truth. And any questions about it could be answered because it is the truth and it always stands. So they had that foundation of scripture, the foundation of reason. And then, of course, we read in verse number eight here that many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. So they heard it, they accepted the truth of it, they believed it, and they obeyed it by being baptized. Then when we come to 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 2 that we looked at a couple of lessons ago, Paul says, I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth, such an one called up to the third heaven. So the third foundation for the message that he preached to them and of the genuineness of his preaching was the miraculous, that Paul uh, had miraculous abilities. And this, of course, was a vision that he had from the Lord, or I say a vision, maybe it was a vision, maybe he actually went you know, to the third heaven. Uh, but either way, it was a miraculous occurrence. And he's using that example here, as we talked about, uh, to say that none of these false apostles could top this. <laughs> no one could can do better in the miraculous sense than going to heaven, which Paul did. But it emphasizes that after preaching the truth, basing it on scripture, basing it on reason and logic, he then confirmed it with miracles. And he performed miracles, and he imparted to them the ability to, to perform miracles. And so the truth that he preached was firmly grounded. And not only was the truth firmly grounded as it was and as it should have been, but also his apostleship and his authority to preach those things was firmly grounded. And so Paul had proved to them and had shown to them very clearly that he was a genuine apostle of Christ and his message was true. And he says in verse 12 here, truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience and signs and wonders and mighty deeds. So everything that he had preached was well grounded and could be shown to be the truth and his authority in preaching those things had been grounded in the same way that the truth was. It came from Scripture, it came through reason and logic, and it came through the confirmation of miraculous abilities. So, Paul has clearly defended his apostleship, and in doing so, he has defended the truth of the message that he preached and has shown why those false teachers should be rejected. So all of that brings us up to chapter 13, where we're going to go through the end of his argument here and then kind of see the conclusion of, of what, he's been, what he's been talking about. So in connection with that, we go back to 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 3, and I think it's interesting and important to notice this statement where he says, For I verily... As absent in the body, but present in spirit, have judged already, as though I were present, concerning him that hath so done this deed. And he's talking about the brother that was living in fornication. Verse 1 talks about um, there in Corinth that they needed to do something about. And in Second Corinthians, we learn that they did. But notice what he says. Even though he was absent in body, he was present in spirit. And I wanted to mention that in connection with Paul talking about here in um, 2 Corinthians 13, 1, this is the third time I am coming to you. So Paul had actually been there physically in body, 
when he came to the city of Corinth and first preached there. But when he wrote 1 Corinthians, he said, even though I'm not there with you physically in body, I'm still present with you in spirit. So maybe his second visit to Corinth was through the letters that he wrote. That could be what he's talking about and and describing. Excuse me. Now, I wanted to mention that verse in connection with this. Because as I mentioned last time, so many people get caught up on the number of visits and number of letters and what they could have said and whatever. Um, The point of it all is that Paul was well aware of everything that was taking place in Corinth. So he says here in verse 1, This is the third time I am coming to you. In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. And what he means by that, there there are kind of two ways to look at this. Um, I think the primary meaning is that he's saying, um, I was there on the first visit, right? So I knew what was going on or whatever, and I left. And then I heard from the house of Chloe and those others who had been there in Corinth what was going on, and I wrote 1 Corinthians. So I was aware of what was going on, and again, it was by inspiration that he wrote that epistle. So there are two witnesses. He says, I'm going to come back the third time, and I'm going to be there among you, and in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. So he's using his visits with Corinth as witnesses. And he says, I was there the first time, I was there the second time, and now when I'm there the third time, if things aren't any better they haven't changed, if you're still in this sinful situation, then the evidence is abundant and overwhelming and action has to be taken. This principle, of course, comes from the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 17, 6, at the mouth of two witnesses or three witnesses shall he that is worthy of death be put to death, but at the mouth of one witness he shall not be put to death. So you couldn't only have one witness, one person who said that this person was guilty of murder. You had to have at least two and better three witnesses. So you couldn't execute the death penalty just with one witness. Well, Paul's not going to execute judgment on the church at Corinth just on his first visit, if you will. So the point is he's given them time and opportunity to correct their mistakes. We see this also in the New Testament. Jesus talks about it in Matthew 18, 16. He says, But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. So when a brother is in sin, even if only one person knows about it, that one person has the responsibility to go to that brother to try to correct him, to motivate him to uh, give up his sin and and to come back you know, to faithfulness. And if he won't listen, then the brother who knows about this other brother's sin is to take one or two witnesses with him. So there'll be two or three who can confirm the truth, testify to the truth that this brother is trying to win back his brother to Christ, that he's trying to uh, get him to come back out of his sins. But it's two or three witnesses. It's not just a one-on-one any longer, but there are witnesses involved. And so that's the principle here. And Paul is using you know, that idea to talk about his visits to the church at Corinth and his association with them, and of course how he, um, how he knew what was going on and so forth, in order to... Um, confirm that they were in the wrong, and then to pronounce judgment, if you will, upon them in the sense that time for for action has come, and he's going to have to, you know, be very bold in dealing with their sins and their sinful situation. So with that in mind, we're going to look here at this passage, um, starting back where we were in verse number one but also continuing over or further down into these other verses. And notice how Paul applies this principle 
this godly principle um, to making this plain and clear, you know, to the church at Corinth. So in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. Now notice verse two. He says, I told you before and foretell you as if I were present the second time and being absent. Now I write to them which heretofore have sinned and to all other that if I come again, I will not spare. And that's the important idea here. Paul says, I will not spare. So he's basically saying to them, I was there with you and I preached the gospel to you and you became Christians and and all of those things. You knew the truth. And I left and these false teachers came in uh, and there was all this division among you and false teachers came in. And so I wrote back to you trying to correct those situations. And that's what 1 Corinthians was about, of course. And so you have all of those divisions and, and arguments and strife that were taking place there in uh, when 1 Corinthians was written, um, starting with their immaturity in chapters 1, 2, and 3, their lack of uh, being guided by the Scripture, instead following human wisdom instead of God's wisdom. And then you have, as we just looked at in chapter 5, the brother who was guilty of fornication. Nobody had done anything about it. Um, they were suing one another at law. They were not united in their worship. There were problems in their marriages. There were um, there was division over miraculous abilities and, and confusion about the resurrection. And Paul writes to correct all of those things. And he hears back from them that they have corrected many of those things. But in the meantime, they've allowed these false teachers to gain a footing in Corinth. And many are believing the false teachers and therefore are beginning to reject Paul. And if you think about it, rejecting Paul meant you didn't have to do all those things that he wrote about in 1 Corinthians. So you didn't have to you know, go along with changing and correcting all those things correcting all those sinful things that he had talked about because that was Paul. And we're not listening to Paul anymore. We're listening to these other men, these false teachers. And so we can just go by what they say instead of what Paul says. And so it was kind of an easy way out, if you will, that this could be our way to not have to make all these changes and corrections that Paul is trying to get us to do. The problem with it was, of course, is that it was complete error and falsehood, that if they didn't make those corrections and changes, they would be disobeying God. And the end result of that is that their souls would be lost. And so he says, I'm telling you, I've told you this before, and I'm telling you now in anticipation of what's coming, I'm saying it to you now as if I'm already there with you. And notice he says the second time, and I think that's interesting, that in verse 1 he says, this is the third time I'm coming to you, but in verse 2 he says, it's as if I were present with you the second time, which seems to me to indicate that he only visited Corinth in person twice, and that the visit in between the two visits was the letter that he'd written to them, or the letters. But either way, he says, I'm telling you this before I get there, as though I'm already there, that I'm not there now. I'm absent, but I'm writing to those who up to this point have sinned and to all others. Even if you haven't listened or excuse me, listened or given in to this false teaching yet, even if you haven't abandoned the truth yet, it's still a warning that a stand has to be made against this error because if I come again, I will not spare. And spare is the idea of sparing them from judgment, from condemnation. And Paul, as he has proven so clearly in these last few chapters, is an apostle of Christ. And he has the authority to pronounce condemnation upon these Christians Because they are, in fact, condemned if they continue rejecting the truth. And notice what he says in verse 3. Since ye seek a proof of Christ speaking in me. 
So he, he says, all this time I've been defending my apostleship, it's because you have been questioning it. You've been seeking for a proof that Christ was actually in me and not in these false teachers. So Paul says, if you want proof, then I'll give it to you. Don't repent of your sins. And when I get there, discipline will take place. And that would not be a pleasant thing for Paul, obviously, but for the congregation. You can imagine that Paul comes in as a true apostle of Christ and begins to call out the sinners by name and to point out their sins and to say, because of your sins, you no longer have fellowship with the body of Christ. And, you know, that they were excluded from fellowship. How uh, hurtful that would be, you know, to, to the congregation in the sense of having these separations take place. And I say hurtful, it, you know, it hurt people's feelings and emotions or whatever, but it would actually be helpful because it would remove the error from the congregation, which would in turn make them stronger. But that's not what Paul wanted to do. It's not what they wanted either. Uh, no one wants to have their sins pointed out and corrected, especially in a public sense like that. So he's telling them, if you want proof that Christ is in me, I can come and show you, but it's not going to be pleasant. But we'll do that. And in fact, if you don't repent of these things and make it right, that's exactly what's going to happen when I come to you again. Now, he says at the end of that statement in verse 3, since you seek a proof of Christ speaking in me, which to you word or toward you is not weak, but is mighty in you. And so this is what the false teachers were saying and what some in Corinth were echoing to Paul, that Christ in us is powerful. He is not weak, but he is mighty. He is strong. He is powerful. But when we look at you, Paul, Christ seems to be weak in you. You don't have a lot of power. And they meant by that, that Paul was constantly being persecuted and chased out of town and arrested and beaten and suffering all these things. Yet here were these false teachers who come in, and because what they're teaching is error, nobody opposes them. And so they're able to very boldly stand up and preach their doctrine and not have any opposition to them. So they look very strong, whereas Paul looked weak. So they were saying, you claim that Christ is in you, but look at you, you're weak. These men claim that Christ is in them, and they appear strong, so who should we believe? So Paul says, if you want proof of Christ speaking in me, I'll give it to you, but it's not going to be what you want or what you expect. And he explains the weakness and the power then in verse number four. He says, for though he was crucified through weakness course, talking about Jesus, yet he liveth by the power of God. For we also are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God toward you. So Paul says, Christ was crucified through weakness. That obviously doesn't mean spiritual weakness, but physical weakness. He was crucified through the weakness of the physical body. So he was arrested, which you can do to a person in a physical body. He was tortured. He was scourged. He was mocked and ridiculed and uh, beaten in the face, spat upon, crown of thorns placed upon his head, the, uh, the robe put upon him as they mocked him, hit him in the head with a reed, and they took the robe off of him and they nailed him to the cross. And then as he died, or just after he died, his side was pierced. Blood and water came forth. All of that was weakness of the flesh. Jesus was outnumbered. He was out overpowered physically, right? Obviously, we understand that. That's how he was crucified, through weakness. Yet, 
he liveth by the power of God. Even though man did all of that to him, the grave could not hold him. His spirit was reunited with his body, and he was resurrected from the grave. He overcame death. He was victorious by the power of God. So even though his death looks like weakness and made him appear weak, in fact, it opened the door to power and to this manifestation of the power of God. Now, Paul says, in him, we also are weak. In Christ, when we live the Christian life, when we teach his truth, when we preach the gospel of Christ, we look weak because people oppose us. When we preach the truth, they arrest us. They attack us. We're we're beaten and we're imprisoned. And all the things that Paul endured and he suffered, it makes us look weak. He understood that, but he also understood that Christ looked weak physically even though he wasn't, and and of course he wasn't at all spiritually. So he says, we are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God toward you. So even though we suffer these things of persecution and it makes us look weak, we have power. It's not necessarily physical power, But spiritual power, you think about back, you know, a couple of chapters ago, Paul's thorn in the flesh. He says that it was a weakness. It made him look weak. If Paul is this great servant of God and God loves him and approves of him, why does he allow him to suffer with this thorn in the flesh? And God said, my strength is made perfect in weakness. Through that weakness, the power of God was able to shine through, to shine forth, right? So he's saying here that being persecuted and, and you know, suffering all these things and being run out of town and, and whatever, it looks weak, but we live with him by the power of God. Just like the power of God raised Jesus from the grave, The power of God keeps Paul going in preaching the gospel. And that power then becomes the the means of the conversions of of sinners. So Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. To everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So he says, we live with him by the power of God, through the power of his word toward you. That when the church at Corinth was thriving, when they were being faithful to God, staying true to his word, growing and maturing, serving him, serving their fellow man, evangelizing, preaching and teaching the gospel, even if Paul is over here in prison, In weakness, he's living in power through the church at Corinth because he's responsible for that congregation existing. And so that's the idea, that the power is not merely physical, but it's spiritual. And it, it has to do again with this comparison to Christ, that even though he looked weak, he was not weak at all, because the grave itself couldn't hold him. Satan couldn't defeat him. Sin couldn't conquer him. He overcame all of those. And Paul is saying, even though men may abuse us and misuse us and arrest us and do all these things to us, we overcome through the power of God. And Paul says that power is directed toward you. We do all of this. We suffer all of this. Paul says, for you. It's for your benefit. We're doing it so you can hear the gospel, so you can be saved from your sins. He wasn't doing it for himself. If he was just in it for himself, he wouldn't suffer those things, but he was doing it for them. So again, who is strong and who is weak? The person who is lying to you, 
preaching a false doctrine to you, even though he's not opposed by men, he's leading you to eternal punishment. Is he really strong? No, he's weak. He's too afraid to stand for the truth because he'll be persecuted or rejected or or whatever. Instead, he wants to teach a message that pleases the ears of people so he'll be accepted. But the end result is that his weakness leads souls to eternal condemnation. And then you have Paul who preaches the truth without fear and without favoritism. It's just what the Word of God says, nothing more, nothing less. And he's, again, persecuted severely for it. So he looks weak, but in truth he's strong because he's standing for right and helping them find the way to heaven, not to condemnation, but to salvation. So who's the strong one and who's the weak one? That's the point that Paul is making. And that brings us now to verse number five. And notice that Paul says here, and it it really kind of sums up everything that we're seeing in this, um, the idea that Paul is bringing here about strength and weakness and uh, about him doing what he's doing, why he preached and why he told them the truth, even if it brought persecution and whatever. It was to give them the ability and the opportunity to do what verse 5 says, examine yourselves. And that is, in a lot of ways, the key thought here. Examine yourselves whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates. But I trust that ye shall know that we are not reprobates. So it gets to the heart of the matter that Paul says, the reason I came to Corinth and told you the truth is so you can examine yourself. The reason I kept on preaching the truth in Corinth was so you could have the standard by which to examine yourselves. The reason why after I left Corinth and heard about things that were happening there, and I wrote back to you in 1 Corinthians, is so you could have the standard to examine yourselves, to see whether or not you were measuring up to God's standard, to what He says is right and what is wrong. The reason I'm writing this letter, 2 Corinthians, is so you'll be able to examine yourselves. I'm giving you the the guidelines, the, the standard, and you have to compare yourself to that standard. And I'm going to come back and visit you again. And how my visit with you goes depends upon whether or not before I get there, you examine yourselves. You take this standard that God has provided and see if you measure up or not. And if you do not, you make corrections to conform to God's standard. But you have to examine yourselves. And this is the important thing about the gospel, the important thing about preaching, the important thing about Christianity is that, you know, preachers can can preach till they're blue in the face, as we say. We can preach the truth. We can we can put it out there uh, from the pulpit, you know, to the congregation in the Bible class over the airwaves of television or radio or the internet or or whatever. We can preach and we can preach and preach, but ultimately every individual has to examine himself or herself by the standard of Scripture. Our job is to present the Scripture, to tell people the truth of what God says, and then it's in your hands. It's in the hands of those who hear to examine themselves, to compare their lives, their hearts, their attitudes, their actions to the Word of God. And that's what it comes down to with the Corinthians. Paul says, I've been there with you. I've labored with you. I've worked with you. I've prayed for you. I've been pleading with you. I've written letters to you. I've done everything that I can to demonstrate how much I love you, how much I care for your souls, how much I desire your salvation. But now you must examine yourself 
to see whether or not you're in the faith. And this is a, a principle that's found throughout Scripture. Go back to Psalm 119 and verse 59, and the psalmist says, I thought on my ways and turned my feet unto thy testimonies. So I thought on my ways. I looked at my life and I said, I'm not measuring up. So I have to turn my feet toward God's word, his testimonies. But he only turned his feet toward God's will when he thought about where he was. He examined himself. Ezekiel 18 and verse 28 says, Because he considereth and turneth away from all his transgressions that he hath committed, he shall surely live. He shall not die. He'll live. He will not die because he turns away from his sins, from his transgressions. But why? Why did he turn away from his sins? Because he considereth. He examined himself. And he said, God says this, but I've done differently. So I have transgressed God's will. If I want to live and not die, I have to turn to God's will. And the thing that brought him to do that was considering himself, his ways, examining himself. Haggai 1 and verse 7, you notice it's also in verse 5. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Notice there in verse 4, God says, Is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses, and this house lie waste? Is it right for you to build luxurious houses for yourself and you haven't even rebuilt God's temple yet? Consider your ways. Think about what you're doing. Verse 6, he says, You've sown much, bring in little. You eat, but you have not enough. You drink, but you're not filled with drink. You clothe yourselves, but there's no one warm. He that earneth wages, earneth wages to put it into a bag with holes. Is this the kind of life you want to live? Three steps forward and two steps back. You're never really getting anywhere. Consider your ways, God says. And he tells them, go build my house. Put me first. Do what I say. Follow my will. And I'll take care of the rest. I'll bless you. Your life will be better if you put me first. But they had to consider their ways, as must we. Paul even said this to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty eight. 28. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. He said in verse 31, For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. So if I don't want to be judged by God on the day of judgment in the sense that stand before him and hear him say, that uh, you know you haven't obeyed my word, if, if I don't want that judgment and that pronouncement of condemnation, then I need to judge myself. I need to now look at God's word and realize that I'm not doing what God says and start doing it. And if I change and start doing what his word says, then on the day of judgment, he won't say to me, you didn't do what my word says. Because I examined myself. I considered my ways. I judged myself and changed before that day came. And that's what Paul's telling the Corinthians. Before I come to visit you, examine yourselves. Fix it yourselves now before I get there, or I will fix it. And it'll be much different when Paul does it than if they did it themselves. Revelation 2, 5 says, Remember, therefore, from whence thou hast fallen, or thou art fallen, and repent and do the first works or else I will come unto thee quickly and remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. Notice, remember from whence thou art fallen. Consider yourself. Think back to where you were and look at where you are now. And consider which one was right and go back to the right way. So it's all about examining ourselves. And so Paul is saying to them, I've given you the truth. I've I've taught it to you over and over again. I've proven the sincerity of my actions. Everything that I've been doing that I have done is for you and for your benefit so that your soul can be saved. Now you must examine yourself, whether or not you're in the faith. So to be in the faith, of course, means to be in harmony with the faith of the gospel the truth 
of the New Testament. To be in the faith means to be in Christ, and to be in Christ means to be obedient to the gospel. Galatians 3, 26 and 27. We put on Christ in baptism, and then we're children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. And then he says to them, Know you not your own selves. Don't you know? You know this. That if you're a child of God, if you've you know been obedient to the gospel and become a follower of Christ, that Jesus Christ is in you. So if you become a Christian, Christ dwells in you and you dwell in him. Now, if you're dwelling in him, you have to remain true to his word. So examine yourselves if you're true to his word so that he continues to dwell in you. He says, except you be reprobates. That word reprobate is an interesting word. Um, it's it's grossly misused sometimes in the religious world, um, especially in Calvinism, to teach to try to teach the idea of uh, total depravity that we're born completely, you know, and totally depraved. The English Standard Version um, says here. Give me just a second. I'm on the wrong verse here. Let me go back. Um, oops, sorry. I keep hitting the wrong button. Uh, but the English Standard Version says here, concerning this word, uh, reprobates, unless indeed you fail to meet the test. And that's the idea of, of reprobate, is that you become... Um, worthless almost is the idea of the word. So Paul is saying to them, you know, examine yourselves, put yourself to the test unless you find out that you've failed the test. The Greek word it carries the idea of, of worthless, of being rejected, of becoming a castaway is the idea. <clears throat> so you're in Christ, you've become a Christian, but if you don't keep on examining yourselves and if you don't remain true to his word, continue in faithfulness, then he says, except you be reprobates, disapproved of, cast away. Now, the religious world says, once you're saved, you're always saved. That, you know, once in Christ, always in Christ, and you can never fall away. Paul says to these Christians at Corinth, you have to keep on examining yourselves and proving yourselves in the sense of testing to make sure you're still living in, living in harmony with God's will, or you'll find out you're disapproved of, rejected, cast away. And then he says, but I trust that you shall know that we are not reprobates. So, Paul says, you know, I, I trust that you've come to understand this about me, Paul, an apostle, that I'm not unfaithful to the Lord. And how could they know that? Because they'd seen the evidence of his life and, of course, of his teaching. And again, they had all those foundational things that we talked about. They had the Old Testament scriptures, they had the reason, the logic that Paul used, they had the confirmation of miracles, the signs of an apostle had been done among them. <clears throat> they knew that Paul was the real deal. He was not rejected of God. He was approved of by God because he examined himself and he stood for the truth always. And that's why he was persecuted. Now it's up to them to do the same, to examine themselves and determine, you know, whether or not they're going to be um, reprobates, accepted or rejected by God. Now notice verse 7. He says, Now I pray to God that ye do no evil, not that we should appear approved, but yet you should do that which is honest, though we be as reprobates. So he says, examine yourself to make sure you're not reprobate, 
I trust that you know, Paul says, that we're not reprobates. But then he says, I pray that you will not do evil. My prayer to God for you is that you do no evil. You don't commit sin. You don't violate God's word. You do what is right. And he says, the reason I pray that is not that we should appear approved. I don't want you to do it because I say do it. And when you do it, that's going to make me look better because, you know, you're approving of me. That's not Paul's motive. He doesn't want them to follow him for the sake of following him. He wants them to follow him so they would be doing what is right, doing what is honest. He says, even though we be as reprobates, even though you consider us reprobate, even though you think I'm not a true apostle, even though you think that I don't have your best interest at heart, even though you think that I'm doing this for the money or whatever, I still want you to do what is right and do no evil, not for my sake, but for yours. And that was always Paul's motivation. It was always about the salvation of souls. And so he prayed that they would not sin, not for his glory, but for their salvation for their doing what was right, no matter what they thought of him. You know, Paul says, you don't have to like me. You don't have to enjoy my preaching or whatever, but you have to accept the truth as the truth and be obedient to it. And that's all that matters. So Paul says, I don't care what you think of me in the sense of approving of him or, or whatever, as long as you accept the truth. And the truth wasn't coming from those false teachers but it was coming from Paul. He says in verse 8, for we can do nothing against the truth before the truth. He's an inspired apostle. He's not going to do anything against the truth of God, right? He's not going to teach something different from the word of God. He's only going to stand by and uphold and proclaim the truth that comes by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And so, they can think whatever they want about Paul, but he is not going to do anything except tell the truth, teach them the truth, show them the word of God so they can do good and not evil. Verse 90 says, for we are glad when we are weak and ye are strong. And this also we wish even your perfection. Paul says, when you're strong, that's what makes us glad. Even if the means of your being strong is our being weak. And remember, when he talks about being weak, he's talking about the persecution and the suffering that he's enduring. And he says, I'm glad to endure persecution if it means the church being stronger. I'm glad to bear this burden and to carry this hardship and this difficulty if it results in strengthening the church. If you're strong, then it doesn't matter if I'm weak. And again, he doesn't mean that he's weak in truth or weak in miraculous power or weak spiritually, but he means weak in the sense of uh, being mistreated and arrested and driven out of town and talked bad about and all of those things. <clears throat> he would gladly endure that if it meant the church being stronger. And he says, this is what we wish. This is our desire, your perfection. And perfection is not sinless perfection, of course, but it is completeness in Christ. It's spiritual maturity. It's walking according to the truth of Scripture, living in harmony with the Word of God, walking in the light as he is in the light. And by doing so, you have continual cleansing of sin. 1 John 1, verses 7 through 9. Paul says, that's what we wish for you. And if we have to suffer in order for that to happen, he says, then we'll suffer. And we'll be glad in our suffering as long as it makes you strong. And then verse 10, he says, Therefore, I write these things, being absent, lest being present, I should use sharpness according to the power which the Lord hath given me to edification and not to destruction. 
So Paul says, and and notice here that he's writing to them while he's not with them, so that when he is with them, hopefully they will have examined themselves and corrected the situation so he doesn't have to use sharpness, severity is the idea of the word, that when he's there among them, they can have a pleasant visit and not one that is, um, you know, him having to reprimand them for their sins. So sharpness is the idea of, it's literally the idea of, of cutting. And so it's abruptness, uh, but it's the idea of being very pointed in one's words. So dealing sharply with someone. And he says, I don't want to do that, not because God's word doesn't do that. It does. It can be sharp toward us at times. It is a double-edged sword. On the day of Pentecost, it pierced them, right? Pricked them in their heart. Um, so God's word has that power, but Paul didn't want to use that in a way that was going to result in harm to the church. And don't misunderstand, God's word never brings harm to the church when God's word, you know, says something is right and a member of the church disagrees with it and follows error. And because of that, they are separated from the body of Christ. That doesn't hurt the body. It makes it stronger. But there's a sadness whenever a child of God is lost and chooses to go back into the world and to become entangled in sin. And Paul says, that's not what I want to do. I don't want to have to come to Corinth and to cut off people from the church because they've entangled themselves in sin. Even though that would help the church in the long run, he doesn't want that to have to happen. He wants all of those who would be cut off to repent, to examine themselves, to change their ways so they won't have to be cut off. So they'll come back to the truth and be obedient to it. He says, the power which the Lord has given me is to edification, to building up, not to destruction, tearing down. He wants the church to be stronger. He wants the church to be more able to do its work and to be a brighter light shining in the community, not to have to go through these kinds of um trials and troubles that might dim their influence or you know might make them weaker he wants the church to be strong and his purpose in preaching is to build up of course not to tear down and i think there's a point to be made there and something to remember in connection with uh with preaching the gospel that our goal in preaching is to be to build up not not to tear down and um there's a way to preach the truth that builds up and edifies and encourages. And there's also a way where you can preach the truth, but actually tear people down and, and bring, bring the church down. And we have to be careful in our presentation of truth that we preach it, you know, in the way that God says, obviously what the word of God teaches, but in a way that builds up and, and encourages so Paul's focus and his goal was always on edification. And that doesn't mean he overlooked sin because he never did. It doesn't mean that he tolerated error because obviously he didn't. But it means just like this letter, he could have just come to the city of Corinth unannounced and dropped the hammer on them. And, you know, had he done that, there might have been some Christians there who had been caught up in this error, who rightfully would have been separated from the church, but because of the way that it's done, it might have hardened their hearts, and they never would have come back. Whereas the approach that Paul takes, again by inspiration with godly wisdom, in writing this letter, gives them an opportunity to correct themselves without him having to come and drop the hammer on them. And souls that might have been lost 
with it happening the other way. And still it would have been their fault for being lost. They would have made those decisions. But by doing it this way, there's a chance that those souls, by coming to see the truth on their own, will be saved. And so Paul says, if there's a chance for the saving of a soul, we're going to take that approach. And there's sometimes there are preachers who just, they can't wait, you know, to, to do the dropping of the hammer. You know, they're just ready to do that immediately. And while it may be scriptural, it may be according to the truth of scripture, it may not be the wisest approach. We have to be patient in our preaching and teaching of the gospel. You know, that great command in 2 Timothy 4 says, Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. And that means long suffering means suffering long, that we have to work hard and diligently at preaching, but also do it with patience toward ourselves as we learn and study and grow, but also toward those to whom we preach. Doctrine, absolutely. Reprove, rebuke, exhort, absolutely. But patience is a part of it. So you can't expect someone to obey the gospel today and be a fully mature Christian by next Sunday, right? There's a growth process, and we have to have patience with that. And Paul demonstrates that here very clearly with the church at Corinth. He says, I've been there, I've written one letter, now I've written a second letter, and the goal of all this is for you to examine yourself. Check yourself. And if you're not measuring up to the standard, fix it yourself. So when I come, I don't have to, because what he's really foreshadowing is the day of judgment. If we don't examine ourselves and correct ourselves now, when the day of judgment comes, God is absolutely going to correct us, but it will be too late then for repentance and salvation. So we have to do it ourselves now to be ready for the Lord's return, just like they needed to do it now to be ready for Paul's return. And that's the principle that he's teaching us. Well, <clears throat> that ends... Paul's defense of his apostleship, and of course it shows his very genuine and sincere motive toward the the Corinthians. He's written more to them than he will to any other congregation in the New Testament. First and Second Corinthians is longer even than Romans. Um, and so he's he's covered a lot of ground with this growing congregation that faced many tests and and trials. And made many mistakes and had many faults. And he's shown us great patience and perseverance in, in how he deals with them. So we come to the end of the chapter now and the end of the book. And we're going to read Paul's uh, farewell to the church at Corinth. Um, we know that he visits them again. He, he writes the book of Romans from Corinth, apparently. And by the way, when he does... Um, it seems that things are better in Corinth. So we certainly hope that that's, that's the case. But this is his farewell to them uh, in these words, and we'll um, consider the last part of the chapter here and, and bring this study to a close. But he says, Finally, brethren, farewell. Now, the word finally is an interesting word that Paul uses because it doesn't always come at the end. Sometimes it'll come in the middle of, of his writings. But it means, uh, now, here's what is left. So here's what follows. So he says, finally, and he calls them brethren. And we need to remember that even though they were struggling and even though they were um, going to the point of no return, they were still brethren. They could still repent. They could still come back home. Okay? So he calls them brethren. And he says to them, farewell. That word farewell, we generally think of as just meaning goodbye. That's kind of how we use it uh, today. But to fare well means to fare well. Just like goodbye has the word good in it, you're wishing someone well. I hope you fare well. 
Okay, so the, the Hebrew word shalom, you know, their greeting means peace. You're wishing peace upon others. I think about Spanish, you know, where you say adios. It's a contraction of vaya con Dios, which means go with God. So when you say goodbye to someone, you're saying go with God, you know, with his blessings. Well, here Paul says uh, farewell. And the Greek word that he uses here is the word Cairo. And it's the word that actually means um, rejoice or joy. And so when Paul says farewell, he means joy to you. Go with joy. And joy is a spiritual um, blessing and principle. It's different from happiness. Joy is comes from being right with God. So when we're right with God, when we know that we're forgiven of our sins and our soul is saved, even if you're having the worst day of your life, you can still have joy, happiness inside because you know you're right with God. And if this day ends terribly, you know, with with my death, I get to go to be with the Lord so I can be at joy and peace uh, anyway. And that's what Paul's wishing for them. Finally, brethren, joy, go in joy. He wants them to be right with God so they can have joy. Then he says to them, be perfect. And again, uh, it's the idea of be perfected. And he wants them, again, to be right with God. Not sinless perfection, but completeness um, in Christ. So you think about Noah it's called, you know, walking perfectly with God, Job, and, and so forth. They weren't sinless, but it means that they were forgiven and they were walking with God in harmony with his will. And that's what Paul wants for the Corinthians to be perfected. He says, be of good comfort. And, you know, that takes us right back to the very beginning of this book. In chapter 1 and verse 3, God is called the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. He goes on to talk about how he comforts us in all our tribulation so that we may comfort others. And that's been one of the themes of the book, comfort from God. But in order to have comfort from God, you have to examine yourself and make sure you're in the faith, right? To be comforted by God, you have to do what his word says. That's where the comfort comes from. And so these last chapters where Paul's been, you know, obviously defending his apostleship, it was for their comfort so they could know the truth. And now he wants them to go and to be perfected and to be of good comfort, to rely upon God and to be true to him. Then he says, be of one mind. And that takes us back to the beginning of 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10, where he told them to be of the same mind and of the same judgment. So the unity that he wished for for them in the very beginning of 1 Corinthians, we come back full circle to it now. Be of good comfort, which takes us to the beginning of 2 Corinthians. Be of one mind, takes us to the beginning of 1 Corinthians. Be united, united in truth, and you'll have joy and perfection and comfort. And then he says, live in peace. Live in peace. So again, Shalom, the Jewish greeting, uh, has to do with being at peace with God uh, through the gospel, which is the gospel of peace, Romans 10 and verse 15. So, be perfect, be a good comfort, be of one mind, live in peace. And then he says, the God of love and peace shall be with you. Of course, God is love, and he's the God of love. He is the source of it. He is loved by his very nature, and because of his love, we can have peace. Greet one another with a holy kiss. Um, the kiss was the common greeting. When Paul says to greet one another with a holy kiss, he's not commanding that you have to kiss someone to greet them. But when you greet someone, as they commonly did by a kiss, make it holy. So not an unholy kiss. It's not a kiss of passion. It's not a kiss of lust. It's not a kiss of betrayal, uh, like when Judas betrayed Jesus. But it's a kiss of fellowship, that we're brothers and sisters in Christ, and we warmly greet 
and welcome one another because we're at peace with one another. And again, here's the point that if this congregation was still in strife and disunity and arguing and fighting with one another, and then you come together for the worship service and everybody greets one another with a kiss, that's a hypocritical kiss. It's not really a holy kiss because you're really not united, so don't act like you are. Be united so your greeting can be genuine. Then he says, all the saints salute you. And that's a a beautiful concept, I think, that there are no factions in Christianity. Right? He doesn't say some of the saints over here, some of the Christians salute you, but others don't really like you, so they don't greet you. He doesn't say all the saints salute some of you, but not that group over there. There, there are no cliques in the church, not supposed to be. Sadly, sometimes there are, and that's one of the things Paul's dealing with with Corinth and why it's so powerful that he says, all the saints salute you. All of the Christians here salute, greet all of the Christians there. There are no divisions. You remember 1 Corinthians, there were all kinds of divisions in the church at Corinth. Paul says it can't be that way, and now it seems that they've worked hard to mend those fences. And so all the saints salute you, and we have to work to keep it that way in the church, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace, Ephesians 4, 3 teaches us. This is why, because you can't have these cliques or divisions in the church. I mean, this is fundamentally why denominationalism is sinful, right? God doesn't want that kind of division among his people. So if we are his people, we cannot be divided that way. And the point is, how do you know if you're one of his? You have to examine yourself. And when you examine denominationalism, you find out that There are people practicing things that don't measure up to the Word of God. But we can't have division in the body of Christ. And then he ends by saying, The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. So you have the Godhead here. You have God, the Father. You have Jesus, the Christ, the Son. And you have the Holy Spirit. Um, So it's one of those verses of which there are many in the Bible that teach the idea of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, three personalities. The order is usually Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but there are exceptions to that, such as here, where you have the Lord, the Son, and the Father, then the Holy Spirit. There are other passages where the Holy Spirit comes first. And and so the point is they're all equal. But here you have the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, which reminds us grace is his favor that is bestowed upon us even when we don't deserve it. So it takes us straight to the cross. That's the grace of Jesus, that he paid that price for my sins. I didn't deserve it, but he did it anyway. That's grace. The grace demonstrated by Christ. The love of God is what makes the grace of Jesus available. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So God's great love gave Christ so grace would be available to us. And the result is communion of the Holy Spirit. Communion is the word for fellowship. So we have fellowship with the Holy Spirit through the grace of Christ and the love of God. They had it in a special sense because they had those miraculous abilities. They knew of their direct fellowship with the Holy Spirit because they could work miracles. Um, We don't have miraculous abilities today, but we still have communion and fellowship with the Holy Ghost, as we do with the Father and the Son, just not in the miraculous way. But fellowship with God is established through God's love and His grace as we examine ourselves and then comply, obey His will, do what His Word says, our sins are forgiven, fellowship is established and maintained with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. It's His love and it's His grace that provides us fellowship when we 
hear as the Corinthians did, and believe and obey, or baptized as they were, and then live faithful. Paul wished for these things to be with them all, every member of the church at Corinth. And then he says, Amen, let it be so. And that was his desire for their spiritual strength and growth and peace, joy, and security in their salvation. I hope that we've benefited from studying the book of 2 Corinthians. Uh, I know I have personally, and I hope you've enjoyed the studies as well. Um, powerful lessons that we've uh, noticed and been able to to look at and to learn, learn from, hear from the Apostle Paul, the great challenges that this congregation faced and how they were able to uh, be confronted with the truth and then meet those challenges through the power of the gospel and the diligent, sacrificial work of a faithful Christian and apostle like Paul. All that he suffered and endured simply for the salvation of their souls. It's an amazing example, and hope that we'll look carefully at it and, and remember it and seek to, to have the same kind of faith that Paul had and to live it the way that Paul did and even to be willing to be weak so long as it makes others strong because that's what Jesus did for us. Imagine the creator of the world allowing his own creation to treat him as though he had no power at all and to kill him, to nail him to a cross. He endured all of that humbling humiliation so we could be saved. And that's what Paul wants us to learn so we can have our fellowship with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Thank you so much for being here and joining in for this lesson and this series of lessons. And I hope that it has, again, blessed you and benefited you. And hope you'll come back with us and, and be with us again in our next Bible study. But thank you for being here. We look forward to being able to study again together next time.